Um, yeah, that's the address of the course site. Set stage for being able to talk about uh, functions of any number of variables and outputting any number of variables. So this R with a double bar here to the left, that's a set of all real numbers. If I put a superscript of N here, that's all ordered N tuples, so generalization of an ordered pair, which I can write a number of ways. I might refer to it using a vector notation X, which would show up as a, a bold X in the notes that has these coordinates that I'll often refer to. And other notation that I'm frequently going to be using, we're often going to be dealing with not all of the real numbers or all the real numbers of dimension n, but maybe just a uh, portion of them. Anytime we're talking about a subset, the way I'll be writing at is t subset of s. t could possibly be equal to s. This is all the information we need just to be able to find functions of any number of variables. So the notation field, and this we'll see very often, function f that maps one set to another. So the set could be all the real numbers, or maybe just a subset thereof. So it's a domain range, and of course the idea behind a function is that for any element in the domain is only mapped to one element of the range. And some terms Terms that are often associated with functions, especially because we're dealing with sometimes um, one variable, sometimes multivariable. Well, just as, as an example of this, so in this case, the domain is all of R2, so all ordered pairs x and y, where x and y are in, or thing I'll often be using, a set of real numbers. So if it was an element in a set S, this is a way I'll often write it. So I'll just make sure everyone's aware of that. So the domain is possible inputs. You can plug any x and y to here that you want. But what about the range? That's a set of all possible outputs. First First of all, what we're going to get, we're putting two numbers in, we're only getting a single number out. Can it be any real number? Yeah, there's no way you're going to get a negative number from this. So the range would be this set, all z, that are greater than or equal to zero. So it's a set of all non-negative real numbers. And the more examples of all of this as we go. Now that's a function that only produces a single number as output, but let's suppose we have a function f with some domain and range. The domain comes from a set of all n tuples of real numbers, so rn, whereas the range belongs to rm. So in other words, f at the point in n-dimensional space to a point m dimensional space. Because we're going to take a look at all different kinds of possibilities during a semester. So if n equals 1, only one input, that's a single variable case. But then otherwise, take more than one input, then we just refer to it generically as a function of several variables that we'll be spending most of our time on. There's also some terminology that goes with how many outputs a function can produce. So for instance, if m is equal to 1, which is true in this case, we only have a single number as output, we say that's a scalar value function. It came up in the context of using a number to scale a vector, but that term ends up being used in many contexts that have little to do with vectors. So any function that produces just a number by itself, we call it a scalar value function. Otherwise, the output is a vector, so this is a vector value function. Especially toward the last part of the course, we'll be dealing with those most of the time. A couple of examples of those. Here's an example of a vector value function. All right, and I'm using this arrow here to indicate that it's a vector. But it's a vector value function of only a single variable, t. We'll see quite a few of these. So the vector has components t, cosine t, the x, t sine t for the y, and e to the t for the t component. So this ends up mapping all the real numbers. If you can plug in any t that you want into a domain, I'll call it v, which happens to be a subset of r3, because these values, they can be anything, um, but e to the t can only be positive. On the flip side, so the function we talked about a second ago, I'll just change it a little bit, f x y z is x squared plus y squared plus z squared. This, we say, is scalar value because once we plug in x, y, and z, we only get one number as output, but it is a function of several variables. Um, so we say that this function maps all of R3 into, I'll call this R plus, that's all real numbers except the negatives. Now, since we're doing fine on time, so the v? v is just, a, I just need some letter to assign to a set. Is the, the exponent there just denote what the... This? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's how many coordinates you have. Right, this is good. They're, okay. One of the main, just from this material, is being able to uh, visualize functions. Of course, function, visualizing functions of several variables, even of two variables, let alone more than that, is a pretty painful exercise. But we'll talk about some things that you can do to help get a feel for that. So first, I give it any function, no matter how many inputs or outputs it takes, we can define what its graph is. It's actually a subset of however many inputs you have. You only have one output in this case. Otherwise, it makes a little sense to talk about graph. So the number of inputs plus the number of outputs. And the graph contains these points, however many inputs you have, and then all of those plugged into the function. So those are the points that you would actually plot if you were going to try to try, try to visualize this function. So for example, so we have this function z equals x squared plus y squared. Graph set of all points of this form, x, y, x squared plus y squared. So whatever you're plugging in and then whatever the uh, result is. And what this 
particular function looks like is if you were to take a parabola, one you're very familiar with, x squared, so this is curve, z is equal to x squared, and I've drawn this parabola in this plane, the xz plane. In the yz plane, we have a similar parabola, and so in fact what we get is this kind of a shape. So I guess you could think of it as a nice, perfectly well-rounded finger pushing down on the origin. Sorry, it's what came to mind. So now what we have here, these um, circles that I've drawn, for example, something we'll be talking more about, these are called level curves. They're curves along which the value of a function is constant. So all of these circles that I've drawn here, uh, we have x and y varying to make a circle, but the z value is constant. So level curves are a helpful way of, uh, of, of visualizing a function. A, um, another example of a graph before we continue talking about level curves, this function, x plus y minus 1. Uh, this is an example of the kind of function we'll see a lot of, a linear function, because if a function, formula for a function involves any of the uh, independent variables appearing just as a uh, either multiplied by a constant or just by themselves, you know, not raised to any power, not as input to any other function, then we call it a linear function. So, generally speaking, a linear function of two variables has this form, ax plus by plus c. So any function of that form is what we call a linear function, our terminology I use quite a bit. The inputs are the independent variables. Whatever outputs you have, those are the dependent. If you have a linear function like this, um, its graph, predictably, is going to be a line. So, of course, a line, any line is uniquely determined by only two points. So for instance, if we let x and y be equal to zero, then our z value is going to be minus one. So this is one point on the line. On the other hand, if we let uh, x and y both be equal to uh, one, then z is equal to one. So this is not going to plot very well. So I go one unit along x, one unit along y, and then one unit up. So this point is going to be right here. Again, it's kind of difficult to see 3D projected onto 2D, but this is going to be the line that passes through uh, those two points. So that is going to be the graph of uh, that function. So, so, so all points x, y, x plus y minus 1. Today, anyway, we'll be focusing on functions that map any number of variables to just one output. So functions that, that, you, that make sense to graph. So a level set of this function, the subset of its domain, on which a function is equal to a constant. So for any value that you choose in its range, uh, there's going to be some level set associated with it, some set of points that produce uh, that value. So if you uh, figure out several of these level curves, or level sets, then that can help you to visualize a function. Now, to specialize a little bit, if we're just talking about a function of two variables, we tend to call these level curves. Right? So what you would see in any contour plot, then they equal three, we call them level surfaces. So it's just a snapshot of a portion, like a, a you think of it as a slice, a cross section of the uh, cross section of the graph, and through several cross sections, you can get an idea of what the graph of the entire function is supposed to look like. Oh, good, I didn't erase it. So these are level curves, as I mentioned earlier, um, of a function z is equal to z is equal to x squared plus y squared. So in general, how do you go about? finding level curves. What you do is, or any level set. So a level curve is described by an equation. That equation is you set the function equal to some value k that's a constant. And it can be any constant that you choose. Now, it should be in the range of a function, otherwise you're not gonna get a level uh, curve. It's, it's gonna turn out to be the empty set. So for instance here, as long as we choose k to be any non-negative number, we're going to get something. Preferably you plug in something positive to get something that's, uh, that's not trivial. Now, if we take a look at this specific function here, x squared plus y, y squared is equal to k, then so we look at that equation for whatever specific function we're dealing with, and hopefully from this equation alone, we can get an idea as to what type of curve it is. We all know what this is, right? What kind of curve is described by this equation? It's a circle. What do we know about the circle? Center, radius. Zero, zero is the center. Square root of k is the radius. Right, so what we can do is, before we try to visualize a function in three-dimensional space, which is kind of a pain to do, a good way to start is by, uh, once we get a feel for what these uh, level curves look like, we can try drawing those in the friendlier xy plane. So in this case, we're going to have several concentric circles for what corresponding to whatever values of k choose. So here we have circles of uh, radius uh, 1, 2, and 3. So this corresponds to k equals 1, k equals 4, and k equals 9. So once we see what these level curves look like, we can use that to get a first indication of what the entire graph in the free space 
going to look like. Because we have this circle where z is equal to 1, this circle when z is equal to 4, and this circle when z is equal to 9. So we can start by placing those curves, once we've plotted them, in three-dimensional space at the appropriate z levels, and then the entire graph begins to take shape from there. So if this is a more systematic approach than what you might do 